I was driving home from the church yesterday going towards the house and flipped the radio on and it's official. Santa Claus is coming to town. I, I heard my first song on the radio yesterday and, and the announcement, Santa Claus is, is, coming, is coming to town. And so we have this first Sunday of Advent, uh, a season of preparation, a time to get ready. You know, in the natural, it takes nine months, uh, but we've tried to collapse that into four Sundays and it's just not enough. And especially since there's this idea that uh, we're thinking about the Christmas tree and Santa Claus coming to town and family gatherings and all those other kind of trappings, and they're not bad. But the church says the best way for us to understand Advent, at least this first Sunday, is to think about what it's like for us now as we wait for Jesus coming again. And so we think about the second advent as preparation for thinking about the first coming of Jesus, the first advent. Thanksgiving, Debbie and I stopped off at uh, her son's house. Uh, she's got uh, a six month grandbaby, a uh, six month year old grandbaby in that house. And so we just had to go by and see that grandbaby. But uh, Ryan wanted to show off all the uh, uh, stuff he's done to his new house. He has bought a house and they've had to go in and do extensive cleaning and redecorating and painting and all those kind of things. Guys, you understand if you let a woman loose in the house, things are going to change. And so he, he was showing it off. We were upstairs though. And as we started coming down the steps, Ryan looked at his mama and said, uh, how do I start teaching my boy, six month year old baby, how do I start teaching my boy about God and, and Jesus and, and stuff like that? And Debbie had that deer in the headlight sort of look. And there was this pause and so, I'm a preacher, what do you expect? I jumped in. I said, pray with him. And that was enough of a, a jump start. Debbie said, and start now. Pray with him. He, he, he added, though, what his concern was. Well, you know, we're going to also tell him about Santa Claus and stuff like that. I wish that I answered. Have you ever had that thought later that I wish I'd have said? Well, I had one of those moments. I wish I'd said, as long as you're not praying to Santa Claus, he'll figure out the difference. We can confuse all the trappings and the celebrations for the event. And the church says, look at the second coming of Jesus to help understand uh, the first coming. And I tell you what, we've never been given such an opportunity as we are today in 2020 to understand what it was like that first go around. Have you ever had a year as hard as this one? We uh, got news Thursday and uh, or, or Friday of Miss Lona's death and then Saturday my college roommate called and his father was at the point of death and they uh, live outside of Jackson but were sent down into Alabama before they could find a facility, facility that would take a COVID patient. And uh, the uh, medications they were giving him jump-started the cancer that they had had in remission. And so Saturday they put Kimsey in uh, hospice and he didn't last long enough for Debbie and I to get there. We were in Alabama coming up, we're gonna pass right by the hospital and just weren't quick enough. Why am I telling you about death? When my roommate called to say that his father had entered eternity, he started reflecting on his own bout with cancer. He said, the first Sunday I was back in church, the preacher said something that was astounding. He read from the Bible and then he said, this is the word of God 
for the people of God. And I suddenly realized, you know, that's really what it is. It's the word of God for the people of God. Now, I'm not trying to say we don't have all the Christmas celebrations we all enjoy. But uh, a friend of mine put it best this morning, Shane L. Bishop is a pastor up in Illinois, and I had to, uh, I had to condense his statement when I posted it on my page. He was a little more elaborate, but my phrasing of it was, we don't have to worry about saving Christmas. Christmas saved us. It's the Savior. And, and today, this focus is, is on a people whom are not well received in the world anymore. Did you ever expect that it would take the Supreme Court ruling this past week for the state of New York to stop mistreating churches and synagogues? To a people that are not in authority, to a broken people, to a people that were being in some ways persecuted, more Christians are killed now than ever before. And the rate is increasing at an increasing rate. And to those people, God came. And the way to think about that is to think about how you and I think when we say, now we said it this morning in the Apostles' Creed, he will come again to judge the quick and the dead. That's the second coming. On first Sundays of the month, we do the Lord's Supper. The pastor says something in that that's called the mystery of faith. Complete the last word. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. That's two words. I'm sorry. I can't count Christ will come again. We say it. It's our doctrine. And today, the message from the Bible is to anticipate that, to keep that in the forefront of our mind because this is the Word of God and it carries us through the hard times. The Word is, but in those days, after that tribulation. Now, what tribulation back in verse 14. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. What is this abomination of desolation? Well, in 167 BC, a guy by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes sacrificed a pig on the high altar in Jerusalem in the temple and desecrated the temple. And you need to understand for the Jewish people, the temple is where heaven and earth came together and was what sustained all of creation. And here it's destroyed, made impure. And it takes eight days of uh, preparation to prepare the oil to reconsecrate the temple. Only trouble is there's only one day's uh, oil in supply. And so in faith, what they did after they regained the temple was they went ahead and lit the candle that would last one day, at least that's the oil it had. And it lit and stayed lit for eight days. And to this day, the Jews still celebrate that miracle. They call it Hanukkah. John chapter 10, when it's told to us that Jesus also celebrated that, he referred to it as the festival of dedication. Thing is, he's telling us it's not a building that is the temple of God. This chapter opens Someone makes reference to the temple. Look what large stones. And Jesus predicts what Daniel has already predicted. The day's coming. It's going to be knocked down. Don't put your faith in a building. But he says there will be great tribulation. There will be trials. 
But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall. The powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest parts of the earth to the farthest parts of heaven. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What's the point of the story? Bad things can happen. You experienced that this year. We've experienced it in this congregation with the death of a long time member. Bad things happen, but God hasn't forgotten us. And the point is, God wins the victory. When Jesus comes, this is not sadness. I mentioned last week that when my daughter was a child, she came home crying from school one day she was in third grade. Daddy, I'll, I'll never grow up and, 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 and be a mommy. And I said, why not? And she said, well, Jesus is coming. And that was seen as an expression of sorrow. By the way, Wednesday she'll be 40. She's still not a mommy, but she'll be 40. She lived anyway. She, she adopts every stray kid she finds. She's got four of them right now. Anyhow, this is not sadness. When he says that, he is saying it to a world that's known grief, that's known persecution, that's known great trials and tribulations. But the point of the story is God wins. The point of the story is there's hope. When it feels we are most hopeless, that's when we should expect the final victory. Uh, Jesus continues today. Now, learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches, when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know summer is near. So when you see these things, now by these things, he's talking about hardships, trials, persecution, tribulation. When you see these things happening, know the it. What's the it? The victory of God. When you see these things happen, tribulation, know the it, the victory of God, is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation, that is, we collectively, the church, is Jesus puts it in Matthew 16, 18, the very gates of hell will not prevail. When this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place, heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will by no means pass away. The parable is telling us that we see these hardships happen and all that should do is telling us it's the season it's only the season when we will know victory. It's the season when God will triumph. When, when it seemed like there was no hope in Israel, here is the Messiah born in a manger. And today, when we cannot put confidence in buildings, when we can't see victory in human life, know that there's victory in the Messiah coming again. But of that day, an hour. No one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the sun. You know, I used to think that that no longer was true because he's now ascended to be with the Father. Surely he knows. You know, the more I think about it, I think it's still a mystery. I think dad is just keeping it for his own sake because otherwise, why would the gospel say, not even the sun? but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray. Now, three times we're being told to watch. Verse 34, 35, and 37. It's repeated not once, not twice. We're told three times, watch. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. 
Watch, therefore, that's the second time. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. Let's pause there and ask, who is the master of the house? Jesus. In the evening, at midnight, at cock crow, or in the morning? Four times are mentioned as possibilities. Did you know that Matthew, uh, Mark will later talk about these same four times on the night Jesus was betrayed? On the night Jesus is taken captive and is put on a show trial and is to the suffering execution. In the evening is Mark 14, 1 through 31. At midnight is Mark 14, 32 through 52. At cock crow is Mark 14, 53 through 72. At dawn is Mark 15, 1 through 20. What's my point? He's saying the victory of God is all wrapped up with Jesus on the cross, what we call the passion, all of that. So even at Christmas, as a way of anticipating, we're supposed to keep our eyes also on the cross. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of a rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly, he find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. This past year and a half, there's been a phrase tossed around. It's got political connotations. It's got racial connotations. Woke. People will say woke. Well, can I tell you, Jesus was wanting us to use that phrase long before a year and a half. Woke. To the phrase that he's coming again. Keep watch. Keep anticipating. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, pour out your Holy Spirit here and upon us that as we celebrate all the trappings of Christmas and enjoy them to the fullest, we remember that in Christmas, God comes as a baby to save. In Jesus' name, amen.